Okay, in the last video we have discussed about the FIR filter design using the windowing technique. Now, in this video we shall try and discuss the IIR filter design using impulse invariance method. So, basically the IIR filter design is essentially converting the analog transfer function of the filter into the digital transfer function. And this can be done using the impulse invariance method or the bilinear transformation method. So, in this case, let us see how to map our desired analog signal H A of S I mean the analog transfer function H A of S where S is our Laplace domain so the transfer function resides in the Laplace domain this is our analog value so from there we need to go to H A of T just simply from the Laplace domain to the time domain by the virtue of our inverse Laplace transform. So this is our transfer function in analog domain. Very well, the next thing that we must do is sample the signals, sample the transfer function. So this becomes H of NTS and the process used over here is sampling where T is equal to NTS and TS is equal to our sampling period. And then after the sampled impulse response what we get is our digitized transfer function that is H of Z. So this is our digital transfer function. And this can be achieved by our very renowned Z or Z transformation technique. So this is our required course of action. Now suppose, suppose we consider H A of S which is our given analog transfer function to be equal to summation where K goes from 1 to capital N a k over s minus p k so p k is our poles of the system so applying the step one is to apply inverse laplace transform so applying 
the inverse Laplace transform what we get is Laplace inverse of H A of S is equal to Laplace inverse of summation a k over s minus b k where k goes from 1 to capital N. Now this can be simplified by decomposing this summation operator. So Laplace inverse a1 s minus b1 plus a2 s minus b2 which goes to so and so up until a n s minus b n now now since the laplace operator for follows the property of linearity so simply we can write so we can write L inverse H of A as Laplace inverse S minus P1 A2 S minus P2 which goes on to Laplace inverse Pn. So this is the linearity property of Laplace transform where if we take the individual inverse Laplace transform of the quantities and take the summation of the quantities and take its inverse Laplace transform the both the values will be same. So now we cannot go much deep into Laplace transform so let me write it down as a form of recollection recollection of Laplace transform you can study Laplace transform it is completely like the continuous time Fourier transform with a minor bit of differences so what we are concerned pr primarily is the Laplace transform of the form 1 over s minus a this is our Laplace variable s this will be equal to e raised to the power of a t u of t which is a renowned formula in the Laplace domain and consequently L inverse of 1 by s plus a will be equal to e raised to the power of minus a t u of t hence we can write from equation say this is a so from A what we get is Laplace inverse of H A of S is equal to A1 this is a 1 so A1 is simply a constant value it does not work for Laplace operation or rather inverse Laplace transform so we can take it out of the Laplace operator so this will be p1 t u of t plus a2 e raised to the power of p2 t u of t and this go until a n e raised to the power of P and T U of T so if that's the case we can once again 
contract this form to a summation where k goes from 1 to capital N a k e raised to the power of p k t times u of t. So simply we can write now inverse h a of s is nothing but h a of t which is equal to summation k1 goes from k equals 1 to n a k e raised to the power of p k t u of t so this is our first operation done where we just converted the analog domain Laplace signal into the time domain form now next is our step 2 so in step 2 we are simply going to use the see let's see over here yeah, the sampling the sampling technique and for doing so so let me write it down first applying sampling technique just replace T with NTS so our desired formula that we have derived over here becomes H A N T S is equal to summation where K goes from 1 to capital N A K E raised to the power of P K N T S times U of N T S. So that is our sampling done. Now our step 3 in the process will be the Z transform. So this is our step 3. So let me write it down. This is step 1. This is step 2. And this will be our step 3. Okay. So let us do that. So our step 3. applying Z transform so we know H of Z is equal to summation where N goes from negative infinity to infinity H of N T S Z inverse. So this is well known to us from the Z transform. Now what we can write is just simply replace this value with H A of N T S rather this expression over here. So we get H of Z summation where let me write down the limit later so this will become summation a k e raised to the power of p k n t s now u of n t s so u of n t s will look like something like this this is our u of NTS if this is NTS so this will be having value from 0 to positive NTS and it will be 0 in the negative side so since we are multiplying u of NTS and the magnitude which is of concern is always 1 
So first of all, multiplying 1 to this magnitude doesn't change the value of the expression essentially. And second thing is our limit. The limit here goes from negative infinity to infinity. But since we are multiplying u of n t s, we can simply change the limit from 0 to infinity because from 0 to negative infinity, the value of u of n t s is equal to 0. So we change the limit from 0 to positive infinity. That's the way we can write u of n t s to be equal to 1. This limit k equals 1 to capital N will remain as it is. This is multiplied by z raised to the minus n. So now what we are going to do is just interchange the summation operator which has been done numerous time in this lecture series and you know the reason why. So k is equal to 1 which goes to capital N a of k independent of small n may reside outside the summation where n goes from 0 to infinity e raised to the power of p k n capital T s z raised to the minus n so this can be further written as summation a k summation e raised to the p k t s times z raised to the minus 1 whole raised to the n. Here n goes from 0 to infinity, k goes from 1 to capital N. So now this expression over here, this expression is in the form of summation a raised to the power of n where n goes from 0 to infinity. So this geometric progression has a value of 1 over 1 minus a. So simply enough we can write h of z to be equal to summation k goes from 1 to n a k 1 over 1 minus e raised to the p k t s z inverse and finally we can write this to be summation k1 n a k over 1 minus e raised to the p k t s z inverse and let us mark it as a1. So similarly from earlier we can write h a of s to be equal to summation k where k goes from 1 to capital N a k s minus p of k let us mark it as p1. I don't know. And now comparing a1 with b1, we can simply write at b1 the poles s minus pk is equal to 0 or is equal to pk. This be w1. And a1, the poles pktls at inverse is equal to 0 or z is equal to e raised to the pktls. So y1. So we have said pk is the value of the poles. So simply we can term this 
factor to be equal to 0 where s becomes equal to pk. Now comparing this denominator with this expression over here similarly we can write z is equal to this value over here. Now now from w1 and y1 we can write z is equal to e raised to the sts because pk is equal to s and this will be our required impulse invariance transform so this is our required impulse invariance transform so we have derived the form of our impulse invariance transform now let us look at the criteria for mapping the impulse invariance transform so we look at the criteria for mapping now the transform where z is equal to e raised to the power of s t let us mark it as w s t s or s t just difference in naming you can use any one you want so now let us revert back to the laplace transform from laplace transform we can write simply s to be equal to sigma plus j omega where omega is the frequency and sigma is our amplitude. I rather discard that, sorry. These are completely different terms. And from Z transform, we can write Z to be equal to R e to the J omega where r is our radius of the unit circle and sigma is our analog frequency that is usually given in hertz and Omega is our angular frequency that is usually given in rad per second, radian per second. So this is quite evident that Omega will be linear in nature and capital Omega will be linear in nature and small Omega will be circular in nature. In our case, will be revolving around the circumference of the unit circle so now equating these two terms we can simply write so now r e to the power j omega is equal to e raised to the power of sigma plus j omega times t just plugging in the value of s and z in equation w so we can simply just simply dissolve this exponent into two different exponents the first one becomes sigma t second one e raised to the power of j omega t now once again comparing the real and imaginary part of both sides we can write so comparing
real and imaginary part so this is our real part since it is not having any j and this will be our imaginary part and consequently in the right hand side r will be the real part sorry in the left hand side r will be the real part and e raised to the j omega will be our imaginary part so we can write r is equal to e raised to the sigma t and just equating e raised to j omega with e raised to j omega t this can be further simplified where omega sigma t which is essentially a proof because as you go back to your intermediate physics where an important term was that just simply multiply our any let us say for angular velocity omega in order to get that we simply multiply the linear velocity with time so this is a way or time in our case is the time period in this way we can determine the angular counterpart of any quantity so this may be the angular velocity and dt will give us the angular distance theta and f times t will give us the angular force that is torque these are our basic concept which is once again proved in this manner just multiply the linear velocity with the time period to give us the angular velocity now let us look at the mapping in the z transform i mean in the s domain or the laplace domain this is sigma and this will be j omega consequently in the z domain this is our unit circle this is real z this is imaginary part of z so let us observe some conditions so when sigma is less than 0 so for sigma less than 0 let there be pole occurring in the right hand side so this will be our poles in that case r will be equal to e raised to the minus sigma t and anything raised to a negative power will always be less than 1 so r will be less than 1 and hence the pole will be mapped inside of the unit circle so these poles are mapped inside of our unit circle